Welcome to South Central Regional Library's Safe Inside Your Walls programming, supported by Safe at Home Manitoba. Hi, my name is Linda and I'm a librarian. Today I'll be reading to you from Etiquette and Espionage, Finishing School Book the First by, ba by Gail Carriger, published by Little Brown and Company. Lesson one, the start of being finished. Sophronia intended to pull the dumbwaiter up from the kitchen to outside the front parlor on the ground floor where Mrs. Barnacle Goose was taking tea. Mrs. Barnacle Goose had arrived with a stranger in tow, meddling old battle axe. With the hallways patrolled by siblings and household mechanicals, eavesdropping was out of the question. The only way of overhearing her mother, Mrs. Barnacle Goose, and the stranger was from inside the dumbwaiter. Mrs. Barnacle Goose had decided opinions on reforming other women's daughters. Sophronia did not want to be reformed, so she had pressed the dumbwaiter into the service of espionage. The dumbwaiter disagreed with the whole idea of stopping at the ground floor and instead kept on going, up all four stories. Sophronia examined the windlass machine at the top. Several lengths of India rubber strapping made up part of the drive mechanism. Perhaps, once the strapping was removed, the dumbwaiter dumb might shake loose. The dumbwaiter had no ceiling. It was simply a bit of platform, with a support cable on the inside and a pulling cable on the outside. Sophronia reached up and liberated the strapping. Nothing happened, so she took more. It was while she wrapped the India rubber protectively around her boots, her mother had been complaining about the state of Sophronia's shoes as of late, that the dumbwaiter started shaking. Sophronia squirmed over to the pulling cable, but before she had a chance to grab it, the dumbwaiter began to descend. Fast. Very fast. Too fast. The loading door on the third floor sped past and then the one on the second. Perhaps removing the rubber was not such a brilliant plan. As the top of the next loading door appeared, Sophronia dove forward, tumbling through it and into the family's front parlor. The top skirt of her dress caught on the lip of the door and made an ominous ripping sound. Unfortunately, Sophronia's grand escape coincided with one of the maids loading a half-eaten trifle into the dumbwaiter. Sophronia hit the pudding on her dismount. The maid screamed. The trifle arched up into the air, scattering custard, cake, and strawberries all over the blue brocade and cream furnishings of the well-appointed parlor. The bull landed in glorious perfection atop the head of Mrs. Barnacle Goose, who was not the kind of woman to appreciate the finer points of being crowned by a trifle. Nevertheless, it made for quite the spectacle as the bull upended the last of its contents over that good lady's bonnet. Until that moment, the bonnet had been rather smart, red, with black velvet ribbons and crimson ostrich feathers. The addition of a trifle, it must be admit admitted, made it less smart. Sophronia, with great restraint, held back a triumphant giggle. That'll teach her to meddle. Mrs. Barnacle Goose was a large woman of progressive inclinations, which is to say she supported vampire and werewolf social reform, played a good deal of whist, kept a ghost in her country cottage, and even wore the occasional French gown. She accepted that dirigibles would be the next great means of transportation, and that soon people might fly through the ether. She was not, however, so progressive as to accept flying food. She squealed in horror. One of Sophronia's older sisters, Petunia, was playing at hostess. White with mortification, Petunia rushed to the aid of the older woman, assisting her in the removal of the trifle bowl. Mother wears nowhere to be seen. This made Sophronia more nervous than the fact that she had just assaulted an aristocrat with a trifle. Mrs. Barnacle Goose stood with as much dignity as possible under the circumstances and looked down at Sophronia sprawled on the plush rug. Most of Sophronia's top skirt had ripped off. Sophronia was mortified to realize she was in public with her underskirt on display. Your mother is occupied in an important private audience. I was going to await her leisure, but for this I shall disturb her. 
It is 1851, and I believe we lived in a civilized world. Yet you are as bad as a rampaging werewolf, young miss, and someone must take action. Mrs. Barnacle Goose made it sound as though Sophronia alone were responsible for the disreputable, disreputable state of the entire British Empire. Without allowing Sophronia a rebuttal, the lady waddled from the room, a plop of custard trailing down her fluffy skirts. Sophronia flopped over onto her back with a sigh. She should check herself for injuries or see to finding the rest of her dress, but flopping was more dramatic. She closed her eyes and contemplated the possible recriminations soon to emanate from her upset mother. Her musings were interrupted. Sophronia Angelina Tominic! Uh-oh. She cracked a cautious eyelid. Yes, Petunia? How could you? Poor Mrs. Barnacle Goose! Stepping in as understudy mother today, we have older sister. Fantastic. As if I could plan such a thing. Sophronia was annoyed by the childish petulance in her own voice. She was unable to control it when around her sisters. I dare say you would if you could. What were you doing inside the dumbwaiter? And why are you lying there in your petticoats with India rubber wrapped around your feet? Sophronia hedged. Uh, um, well, you see... Petunia looked inside the open cavity of the dumbwaiter where the remains of Sophronia's skirt dangled narrowly. Oh, for goodness sake, Sophronia, you've been climbing again. What are you, a ten-year-old apple boy? Actually, I'm right in the middle of a recovery period, so if you wouldn't mind shoving off until I'm finished, I'd appreciate it. Petunia, who at sixteen considered herself all grown up, was having none of it. Look at this mess you created! Poor Eliza! Eliza, the now trifleless maid, was trying to put some order to the chaos that had resulted from finding an unexpected Sophronia departing the dumbwaiter. Sophronia crawled over to help with the strawberries and cake that now covered the boom. Sorry, Eliza, I didn't mean it. Never do, miss. Petunia was not to be distracted. Sophronia! Well, sister, to be perfectly correct, I did nothing. Tell that to the poor woman's lovely bonnet. The trifle did it. Petunia's perfect rosebud pout twisted into a grimace that might have been an attempt to hide a smile. Really, Sophronia, you're fourteen years old and simply unfit for public consumption. I refuse to have you at my coming out ball. You'll do something dreadful, like spill punch on the only nice-looking boy there. I would never. Oh, yes, you would. No, I wouldn't. We don't happen to be acquainted with any nice-looking boys. Petunia ignored that jibe. Must you be so tiresome? It's always something. She looked smug. Although I believe Mumsy has finally determined what to do with you. She has? Do? Do what? What's going on? Mumsy is indenturing you to vampires for a proper education. You're old enough now for them to actually want you. Soon you'll be putting your hair up. What else are we to do with you? You are even, even starting to get décolletage. Sophronia blushed with embarrassment at the very mention of such a thing, but man managed a sputtered protest of, She never! Oh, yes! Who do you think she's talking to right now? Why do you think it's such a secret meeting? Vampires are like that. Mumsy had, of course, made the threat when any of the Tuminic children were being particularly wayward, but never could Sophronia believe such a thing act actually possible. But it's tea. Vampires can't be here. They can't go out in daylight. Everyone knows that. Petunia, in her Petunia-ish way, dismissed this defense with a careless flap of one hand. You think they would send a real vampire for the likes of you? Oh no, that's a drone Mumsy is talking with. I wager they're drawing up the papers of servitude right now. But I don't want to be a vampire drone, Sophronia winced. They'll suck my blood and make me wear only the latest fashions. Petunia nodded in an I-know-more-than-you manner that was highly aggravating. Yes, yes, they will. Frobritcher, the butler, appeared in the doorway. He paused on the threshold while his rollers transferred to the parlor track. He was the very latest in domestic mechanicals, about the size and shape of a Daphne bush. He trundled over and looked down his beaky nasal protuberance at Sophronia. His eyes were jet-colored circles of perpetual disapproval. 
Miss Sophronia, your mother wishes to see you immediately. His voice, emanating from a music box device deep inside his metal body, was tinny and grainy. Sophronia sighed. Is she sending me to the vampires? Petunia wrinkled her nose. I suppose there is a possibility they won't take you. I mean to say, Sophronia, the way you dress. The butler only repeated, without any inflection whatsoever, immediately, miss. Should I make for the stable? Sophronia asked. Oh, do grow up, said Petunia in disgust. So I can be a puffed up poodle faker like you? As though growing up were something one could do contagiously, caught through associating with officious older sisters. Sophronia trailed after Fro Butcher, nervously brushing her custard-covered hands against her apron. She hoped the pinafore would hide the disreputable, well, absent, state of her skirt. The butler rolled down the hall, leading her to her father's library. An elaborate tea service was arranged there, including lace tablecloths, sponge cake, and the family's very best china. This was far more effort than was ever spent on Mrs. Barnacle Goose. Across from Sophronia's mother, sipping tea, sat an elegant lady wearing a sour expression and a large hat. She looked like exactly the kind of woman one would expect to be a vampire drone. Here is Miss Sophronia, madam, said Frobritcher from the doorway, not bothering to transfer track. He glided off, prob probably to marshal forces to clean out the parlor. Sophronia, what did you do to poor Mrs. Barnacle Goose? She left here in a dreadful huff and, oh, simply look at you. Mademoiselle, please excuse my daughter's appearance. I tell you it was an aberration, but sadly it's all too common. Such a troublesome child. The stranger gave Sophronia a prim look that made her feel about six years old. She was painfully conscious of her custard estate. No one would ever describe Sophronia as elegant, whereas this woman was every inch a lady. Sophronia had never before considered how powerful that could be. The strange woman was also offensively beautiful, with pale skin and dark hair streaked with grey. It was impossible to discern her age, for, despite the grey, her face was young. She was perfectly dressed in a sort of spiky lace travelling gown with a massive skirt and velvet trim that was much more elegant than anything Sophronia had ever seen in her life, her mother was more a follower of trends than a purveyor of fine taste. This woman was truly stylish. Despite her beauty, she looks, Sophro thought Sophronia, a little like a crow. She stared down at her feet and tried to come up with an excuse for her behavior other than spying on people. Well, I simply wanted to see how it worked, and then there was this, her mother interrupted, how it worked? What kind of question is that for a young lady to ask? How often have I warned you against fraternizing with technology? Sophronia wondered if that was a rhetorical question, and began counting up the number of times, just in case it wasn't. Her mother turned back to their guest. Do you see what I mean, mademoiselle? She's a cracking great bother. What? Mumsy? Sophronia was offended. Never before had her mother used such language in polite company. Silence, Sophronia. But do you see, Mademoiselle Geraldine, do you see what I must endure? And on a daily basis, a bother has been from the beginning. And the other girls were such little blessings. Well, I suppose we were due. I tell you this in complete confidence. I'm at my wit's end with this one. I really am. When she isn't reading, she's taking something apart, or flirting with the footman, or climbing things, trees, furniture, even other people. That was years ago, objected Sophronia. Will she never let that go? I was eight. Hush, child. Mrs. Tominick didn't even look in her daughter's direction. Have you ever heard of the life with a girl? Now I know she's a little brazen for finishing school, but I was hoping you might make an exception just this once. Finishing school? Then I'm not being sent to the vampires. Relief flooded through Sophronia, immediately followed by a new horror. Finishing school. There would be lessons on how to curtsy, on how to dress, on how to eat with one's finger in the air. Sophronia shuddered. Perhaps a vampire hive was a better option. Mrs. Tominick pressed on. 
We are certainly willing to provide compensation for your considering Sophronia. Mrs. Barnacle Goose told me in confidence that you are masterly with troublesome, troublesome cases. You have an excellent record. Why, only last week one of your girls married a Viscount. Sophronia was rattled. Really, Mumsy? Marriage? Already? As yet, the crow had said nothing. This was a common occurrence around Sophronia's mother. The stranger merely sipped her tea, the bulk of her attention on Sophronia. Her eyes were hard, assessing, and her movements very precise and sharp. Mrs. Timinick continued, And of course there is dear Petunia's coming out ball to consider. We were hoping Sophronia might be presentable for the event. This December, well, as presentable as possible, given her defects. Sophronia winced. She was well aware she hadn't her sister's looks. For some reason, the fates had seen fit to design her rather more in her father's image than her mother's, but there was no need to discuss such a thing openly with a stranger. That could be arranged. When the woman finally spoke, it was with such a strong French accent that her words were difficult to understand. Miss Timinick, why is there India rubber wrapped around your boots? Sophronia looked down. Mumsy was complaining I kept scuffing them. Interesting solution. Does it work? Haven't had a chance to test them properly. She paused. Yet. The stranger looked neither shocked nor impressed by the statement. Frobricher reappeared. He made a motion with one claw-like mechanical arm, beckoning. Sophronia's mother stood and went to confer with the butler. Frobricher had a sinister habit of turning up with secrets. It was highly disconcerting in a mechanical. After a whispered exchange, Mrs. Tminick went red about the face and then whirled back around. Oh dear, thought Sophronia, what have I done now? Please excuse me for a moment. There appears to be some difficulty with our new dumbwaiter. She gave her daughter a pointed look. Hold your tongue and behave, young lady. Yes, Mumsy. Mrs. Tminick left the room closing the door firmly behind her. Where did you get the rubber? The crow dismissed Sophronia's mother with comparative ease, still intrigued by the shoe modification. India rubber was expensive and difficult to come by, particularly in any shape more complex than a ball. Sophronia nodded in a significant way. You destroyed a dumbwaiter for it. I'm not saying I did. I'm not saying I didn't either. Sophronia was cautious. After all, this woman wants to steal me away to finishing school. I'll be there for years and then foist it off on some Viscount with two thousand a year and a receding hairline. Sophronia rethought her approach. Perhaps a little less circumspection and some judiciously applied sabotage was called for. Mumsy wasn't lying, you understand, about my conduct, the climbing and such. Although it has been a while since I tried to climb up a person, and the footman and I weren't flirting. He thinks Petunia is the pip, not me. What about the taking apart? Sophronia nodded, as it was a better excuse for destroying the dumbwaiter than spying. I'm fond of machines. Intriguing things, machines, don't you find? The woman popped her head to one side. I generally prefer to make use of them, not dissect them. Why do you do it? To upset your mother? Sophronia considered this. She was relatively fond of her mother, as one is apt to be, but she supposed some part of her might be on the attack. Possibly. A flash of a smile appeared on the woman's face. It made her look very young. It vanished quickly. How are you as a thespian? Any good? Theatricals? What kind of a finishing school teacher asks that? Sophronia was put out. I may have smudges on my face, but I'm still a lady. The woman look at, looked at Sophronia's exposed petticoat. That remains to be seen. She turned away as though not interested any more and helped herself to a slice of cake. Are you strong? Down the hall, something exploded with a bang. Sophronia thought she heard her mother shriek. Both she and the visitor ignored the disruption. Strong? Sophronia edged towards the tea trolley, eyeing the sponge. From all the climbing, a pause, and the machine lifting, I suppose. 
Sophronia blinked. I'm not weak. You're certainly good at prevarication. Is that a bad thing? That depends on whom you're asking. Sophronia helped herself to two pieces of cake, just as though she had been invited to do so. The visitor forbore to remark upon it. Sophronia turned away briefly in the guise of finding a spoon to tuck one piece in her apron pocket. Mumsy wouldn't allow her any sweets for the next week once she found out about the dumbwaiter. The woman might have seen the theft, but she didn't acknowledge it. You run this finishing school, then? Do you run this finishing school, Mademoiselle Geraldine? corrected the crow. Do you run this finishing school, Mademoiselle Geraldine? parroted Sophronia dutifully, although they had not been properly introduced. Odd in a finishing school teacher. Shouldn't she wait until Mumsy returns? It is called Mademoiselle Geraldine's Finishing Academy for Young Ladies of Quality. Had you heard of it? Sophronia had. I thought only the very best families were allowed in. Sometimes we make exceptions. Are you the Mademoiselle Geraldine? You don't seem old enough. Why, thank you, Miss Timinick, but you should not make such an observation to your betters. Sorry, madam. Sorry, Mademoiselle Geraldine. Oh, yes, sorry, Mademoiselle Geraldine. Very good. Do you notice anything else odd about me? Sophronia said the first thing that came to mind. The grey in your hair, it seems amiss. You are an observant young lady, aren't you? Then, in a sudden movement, Mademoiselle Geraldine reached and pulled out the small throw pillow from behind her back. She tossed it at Sophronia. Sophronia, who had never before had a lady throw a pillow at her, was flabbergasted, but caught it. Adequate reflexes, said Mademoiselle Geraldine, wiggling her fingers for the return of the pillow. Bemused, Sophronia handed it back to her. Why? A black-gloved hand was raised against any further questions. Mrs. Timinick returned at that juncture. I do apologize. How incurably rude of me. I can't comprehend what has happened to the dumbwaiter. It's making the most awful racket. But you don't want to hear of such piddling domestic trifles. She put a great deal of emphasis on the word trifles. Sophronia winced. Mrs. Timinick sat down, rubbing at a grease spot on her formerly impeccable gloves. How are you and Sophronia getting on? Mademoiselle Geraldine says. Quite well. The young lady was just telling me of some history book she was recently reading. What was the subject? So she doesn't want Mumsy to know she's been throwing pillows at me. Sophronia was never one to let anyone down when fibs were required. Egypt! Apparently, the primeval monarchy, which follows directly after the mythical period, has been given new dates, and her mother interrupted. That's more than enough of that, Sophronia. A headmistress isn't interested in education. Really, Mademoiselle Geraldine, once you get her started, she'll never stop. She looked hopeful. I know she's a terrible mess, but can you do anything with her? Mademoiselle Geraldine gave a tight smile. What did you say to a probationary period? We'll return her in time for that coming-out ball of yours in a few months, and see how she gets on until then. Oh, Mademoiselle Geraldine, how perfectly topping! Sophronia's mother clasped her hands delightedly. Isn't this thrilling, Sophronia? You're going to finishing school! But I don't want to go to finishing school! Sophronia couldn't help the petulance in her voice as visions of parasol training danced through her head. Don't be like that, darling. It will be very exciting! Sophronia grappled for recourse, but she threw a pillow at me. Oh, Sophronia, don't tell Fibs you know how unhappy that makes me. Sophronia gawped, swiveling her gaze back and forth between her now animated mother and the crow-like stranger. How soon can she be made ready, Mademoiselle Geraldine wanted to know. Sophronia's mother started. You wish to take her away now? I am here, am I not? Why waste the trip? I didn't think it would be so soon. We must shop for new dresses, a warmer coat. What about her lesson books? Oh, you can send all that along later. I shall provide you with a list of required items. She'll be perfectly fine for the time being. A resourceful girl, I suspect. Well, if you think it best, I do. Sophronia was not accustomed to seeing her mother railroaded so effectively. But Mumsy... If Mademoiselle Geraldine thinks it best, then you had better hop to it, young lady. Go change into your good blue dress and your Sunday hat. 
I'll have one of the maids pack your necessities. May we have half an hour, mademoiselle? Of course. Perhaps I will take a little tour of the grounds while you organize to stretch my legs before the drive. Please do. Come along, Sophronia. We have much to do. Frustrated and out of sorts, Sophronia trailed after her mother. Accordingly, she was given an old portmanteau from the attic, three hat boxes and a carpet bag, with barely enough time to ensure a nibble for the drive to goodness knows where at a distance of goodness knows how far, Sophronia found herself being shoved hastily into a carriage. Her mother kissed her on the forehead and made a show of fussing. My little girl, all grown up and leaning to become a lady. And that, as they say, was that. Sophronia might have hoped for a grand send-off with all her siblings and half the mechanical retainers waving tear-stained handkerchiefs. But her younger brothers were exploring the farm, her older ones were away at Eton, her sisters were busy with fripperies or marriages, possibly one and the same, and the mechanicals were trundling about their daily tasks. She thought she spotted Roger, the stable lab, lad, waving his cap from the hayloft, but apart from that, even her mother gave only a perfunctory waggle of her fingertips before returning to the house. And that is the first chapter or lesson of Etiquette and Espionage by Gail Carriger. And if you want to know what happens next, you'll have to read the book. Thank you for joining us for this Safe at Home Manitoba production. Stay safe inside your walls.